Okay. Well, I think we're even by Willow County standards, we're uh, we're okay to get going. So it's a great pleasure to have Steve Pine join us today. And we met, and I I just told him I invited Betsy Marston, who used to be at High Country News, and him, who when we decided here to do a program at a winter fish trap on fire and I talked to Betsy and she said well you got to get Steve Pine there and then uh, she uh, and and uh, who was the rancher from down your way that she also hooked us up with oh dog oh, forget his name he was from uh, Rio Doso yeah New Mexico yeah his first name was Sid something that's right Sid yeah Sid yeah Sid yep Anyway, and uh, and we had a heck of a weekend. We were up at Willow Lake, and I don't remember, Nick, uh, there were quite a few BLM and Forest Service uh, firefighters who came to that thing. And what I remember is some of them saying, uh, geez, I'm glad you're having this thing in the middle of the winter. I wouldn't come up here in the summertime. And uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> Willow Lake's in a little better shape now than it was then, but it's still a little bit... Uh, Given the state of fire well, in the West, it's probably not the. the yeah, we we did a we did a fuels reduction around the edge of the community there back in the oh early two thousands, but it probably needs to be done again. Good. Okay. So anyway, then uh, then we got Steve to come out here, and uh, what I remember about Steve there at that th at that particular conference is he sat us down. And then said, uh, forget what you learned about uh, man becoming man with uh, that opposable thumb business. Man becomes man when he learns to start and stop fires. And uh, he, he took us on an hour, hour or hour and a half long uh, uh, history of fire that, uh, uh, that traveled, traveled all of time in the world. And it was a, quite an engaging thing. And the whole, the whole conference was a good one. Anyway, so when uh, John Marshall came with this idea and we started talking about programs to go along with the exhibit, Steve came to my mind immediately and I wrote to him and he agreed to join us. So with that, Steve, you should be able to share screen and take it away. Okay. Well, thank you for the chance to return. Now, I, I won't give you the global survey. Uh, I will give you a, a brief survey of American history. Um, not exactly a forced march, but not quite a planetary flyby either way of, of the last 150 years or so. I'll call it between three fires because uh, well, we'll begin here. This is actually what the pyrogeography of the US looked in 1880. The census actually did a map of forest fires and the darker areas are the more um, the higher percentage of the county land burned. Uh, it doesn't include deserts. It doesn't include steppe lands. It doesn't include uh, high grasslands. Uh, but it's a very interesting map and quite different from what we we see today. Uh, it incorporates all the fires nature set. It incorporates and mostly what it incorporates are the fires set by people, both the indigenous people. Um, in the country and new settlers. And the third fire, what will really become the great disturbance in the force, uh, industrial combustion. Uh, just starting, still really starting to scale up. At, uh, um, and it conveniently in this Courier and Ives, uh, it's dividing the world between burnt and unburnt. And I'll come back to that later. Uh, to be candid, uh, there were plenty of bad burns. I mean, we all know that there can be good fire. We're trying to promote more good fire, but uh, as a result, particularly catalyzed by the railroads of opening up new land wholesale to land clearing and logging um, and then distributing sparks with abandon, we had a whole wave of mega fires, an order of magnitude larger in scale and lethality than what we've had in recent decades. Hundreds of people killed, millions of acres burned, um, whole communities uh, wiped out. And this continues really up until 1918. 
it didn't go unnoticed. There were lots of uh, efforts to think about how uh, uh, society, especially through the state, should intervene. Lots of proposals. Uh, we also forget the Northeast had its mega fires. I mean, in 1903, 600,000 acres burned in the Adirondacks. Um, so that brought the brought the issue home to people in the East Coast in ways that a lot of uh, Western stuff did. The National Parks, 1886, the US Cavalry rides in, puts out 50 fires that summer, runs the parks for 30 years, which is why they have that funny uniform, um, and uh, established a pattern uh, of sort of paramilitary pattern of federal fire control. Um, science was brought to bear, the National Academy reported on it, the USGS, which was the major um, scientific institution of the government uh, became involved and people like John Wesley Powell got involved in the fire controversies. But eventually it fell to foresters, which was true around the world. Here's our first professional forester, Bernard Furneaux, trained in Prussia, dismissing the whole fire scene as one of bad habits and loose morals. Uh, we began setting aside forest reserves. Again, it was a global project. Uh, an organic act following the National Academy report, 1897. And then the US Forest Service is given the, the uh, operation in 1905. And here's Gifford Pinchot uh, prior to that, arguing that uh, the question of forest fires is analogous in ways to the question of slavery and proposing a kind of abolitionist solution. Uh, it was very much a project of the of the progressive era, applied science and uh, technocratic bureaus uh, could solve uh, national crises. Uh, when it started, we had roughly one fire guard for six, every 670 square miles of national forest. I mean, you had to, what were these people thinking about? Well, they had no idea of the scale of the fire problem and they had no real appreciation of the natural potentials of it. They saw it as a problem um, as Ferno did, of social control and regulating people. As I say, it was uh, an international project. A lot of the US was modeled on British experience in India. There's our, our hilltop forester uh, looking out for fires, jungle fires, and then uh, the drum he would use to rally the local villagers to help fight it. Well, the problem was that the villagers were usually the ones setting the fires and they had absolutely no interest in putting them out. Uh, the turning point occurs in 1910, the fabled big blow up, uh, three and a quarter million acres or so burning in the Northern Rockies. And you can see by this map, which was produced uh, in the year following the fires, uh, that uh, your part of the country was involved as well, not quite at the same scale. Um, they even mapped the smoke. So our large smoke poles of recent years uh, have their precedent as well. Uh, and of course, great stories coming out of it. Most famous, Ed Pulaski holding his crew in the Nicholson Adit here uh, at gunpoint while the fires raged around them. Uh, and that same month, William James published a final essay, The Smoke, he was dying in his New Hampshire uh, cottage and the smoke from the 1910 fires were actually passing overhead and turning the sun to a coppery color arguing that we needed to redirect all of our martial enthusiasms to productive pursuits. And he urged a moral equivalent of war, a national conscription of use to begin a war on our common enemy, which was the forces of nature. So there it is from Ed Pulaski, sort of folk hero ranger uh, to Harvard professor. There's a sense in which uh, we will rally and, and meet the challenge. Uh, the Forest Service was traumatized by 1910 78 firefighters died in six different incidents in the same afternoon and evening. And it was put a million dollars in debt, which was real money in 1910. That same month in Northern California, uh, a counter proposal uh, boiled up. Uh, this was known as light burning. And it was argued that uh, the whole approach emulating sort of European and military style fire protection was misguided. What we really needed to do was to emulate the American Indian and practice routine burning or what was called light burning in our montane forests. And there's a sample in the upper right of uh, 
of uh, the Black Hills. And the larger photo is actually from the Plumas National Forest, uh, probably not far from where Paradise, California burned uh, more recently. Uh, and this was widely held. And here's the Plumas Boundary Survey in 1904, recording that you know, everybody is burning. Uh, the Indians were accustomed to burning the forest and now all, all the people who uh, use and travel through the forest do as well and they all consider it beneficial. And here's Aldo Leopold who uh, established the fire control system for the Forest Service in the Southwest writing in 1920, arguing against light burning. In many ways, I don't think Leopold ever quite converted uh, to fire as a positive good. It was something that might be tolerated. So uh, we have a real case here of sort of folk versus elites. Um, and it turns out the folk were right in this case. Anyway, for the next uh, four, four generations of chief foresters, um, the 1910 fires uh, were a kind of haunting presence and they were determined it would never happen again. Uh, so until then, uh, they really had a, a very aggressive policy of fire exclusion, which they extended through the states, thanks to the Weeks Act, which set up uh, a matrix for a national infrastructure of fire, again, spurred on by uh, what they perceived as the catastrophe of, of uh, 1910. So until this generation passes, uh, we won't really have an alternative point of view. Now, let's, uh, we also need to be clear that not all of the fire exclusion problems in the West are the result of the Forest Service or are restricted to uh, the national forests or the result of, of misguided policy. Most of it started in the West. It's really true in the Southwest, but in much of part of your world as well with, with very extensive grazing uh, 20, 30 years before the Forest Service came on the scene. So in many of these landscapes, the process of fire removal was already underway and it made it easier to intervene and put out what fire started. So beginning with 1910, uh, Forest Service begins a project that for 50 plus years uh, will become really, a, they will become really a hegemon for American fire. Uh, they will become the matrix for all the kinds of fire operations that will happen on landscapes, through the states, uh, through um, other organizations, whatever, and their policy will prevail. And it will be a policy of fire suppression. And some examples of uh, firefighting technologies and efforts around the country. It's extraordinary how tenacious um, and in some ways fearless uh, these characters were with regard to fire and their determination. But you still had stubborn parts of the country where a long resident population continued to burn in defiance of all logic and law. Uh, so in the Southeast, the Dixie Crusaders were organized to bring a kind of uh, evangelical revivalist style uh, propaganda uh, to the locals. Uh, they showed movies, they set up tents, they got people to uh, swear off, take the pledge, um, swear off woods burning, but there was a lot of backsliding. In fact, it remained so frustrating that the Forest Service finally hired a psychologist to investigate why these people were so resistant to evidence and science and why they continued to burn in defiance of all of all logic. Uh, John Shea is now one of the most hated figures in Southern fire lore um, and really had no good explanation. They did it because it was traditional. So this, this is fine for sort of front country lands, but what do you do with all that big back country, uh, remote in space, no roads, few trails, no lookout towers. What do you do with all that other landscape that was remote in time, in a sense, it had been cut over, burned, and abandoned. Well, what happens is the New Deal, uh, and especially the Civilian Conservation Corps, shown here going to that fire in the background, the Tillamook burn in 1933, and then creating uh, a tree army that could be mobilized for fire. Uh, almost overnight, an infrastructure for fire is put into place. 
1934, fires are back in the Northern Rockies in the Selway area. Uh, chief Forester Gus Silcox had been the number two man in 1910. Now he's chief forester. Uh, he convenes a conference in Missoula to debate what should, what the agency should do. And they, they, it was polarized. You, there was no middle ground that they could find. You either walked away from it or you doubled down. And uh, they decided to double down. So in 1935, the 10 a.m. policy uh, was announced, um, made possible surely by the presence of the Civilian Conservation Corps. The means were so large that in a way they began to determine the ends. So here's a, a field break in California. Uh, the largest one, the Ponderosa Way was 750 miles, uh, combined with truck trails that span the entire Western front of the Sierra Nevada. And out of the CCC experience, we got our two major uh, fire crews, initial attack crews, uh, smoke jumpers, 1939, and uh, the 40 man crew um, developed actually in Oregon uh, that became the forerunner of the hot shots. Uh, the project had uh, interest and support at the highest levels. Uh, President Roosevelt always considered himself a gentleman forester. Here he is. Uh, personally overseeing a new uh, publicity campaign featuring Uncle Sam, who looks suspiciously like the guy right next to the poster, who is in fact the artist, James Montgomery Flagg, who modeled Uncle Sam on himself. And then it goes to war. It's a real war this time. Uh, and as happens periodically, the American firefighting fire management effort uh, gets militarized and in fact, the US was attacked by fire balloons from Japan. And the only uh, civilian casualties suffered on American soil were as a group of picnickers outside Klamath Falls, uh, which stumbled on one of these balloons. About 7,000 were launched and hundreds did reach the US armed with incendiary uh, grenades and uh, bombs. The war is in many ways a fire war ending with a new fire weapon Here's the famous photo of the Hiroshima atomic strike taken by the US Army. The problem is this is not the mushroom cloud of the atomic bomb. This is the pyrocumulus cloud from the burning city. And that got military interest. Lots of military interest about fire as a weapon, using it and protecting yourself against it. It was during the war as well that the our first national fire prevention programs came about. Here we are in 1942, Southern California, worried about uh, possible incendiary attacks from uh, Japan. Uh, fortunately in 42, Disney releases Bambi, a great fire climax. And so Bambi is mobilized uh, in place of that rather hardcore uh, project, but Disney wouldn't allow licensing beyond one year so they had to invent a cartoon to replace Bambi and gave us Smokey Bear. And then in 1950, a little bear cub, uh, life imitates art and we were on our way. After the war, uh, especially after Korea, um, lots and lots of war surplus equipment is available. And that uh, the Forest Service and its cooperators, the states have priority access. So almost overnight, we mechanized. We replaced the CCC with basically machinery. In a sense, we're on a Cold War on fire, the, the other red menace. Uh, science is mobilized, Operation Fire Stop in 1954. Equipment development centers uh, are created to help the conversion. We get three forest fire labs. It's hard to imagine those labs happening without the support from uh, DOD and the Office of Civil Defense. And that's also a reason why so much of that early lab work was focused on fire control. How do fires start? How do you stop them? Even Hollywood gets in the act and we have uh, classic movies like Red Skies of Montana, uh, which comes out in the Korean War and is clearly a war movie. And in some ways, Hollywood has never gotten over it. I can only think of one Hollywood movie other than Bambi. Um, and the recent, only The Brave, which features a hotshot crew that does not feature smoke jumpers. It seems to be obligatory. 
1960, the Forest Service seemed to have achieved its, its task. Uh, it had become sort of the indispensable core agency for everything. It controlled everything. I mean, the entire National Park Service had two dedicated fire officers for its entire system. It's hard to imagine that how utterly the Forest Service um, touched every, every and influenced every aspect of it. And in fact, in 1960, a famous study, the Forest Ranger was published, which identified the Forest Service as a model agency. This was as good as public administration got. This was the Paragon. You couldn't get better. 50 years later, the Forest Service will be identified by many observers as the epitome of dysfunctional democracy. So what happens to the agency is also a story of fire, not that fire becomes dysfunctional completely. It's just that uh, it's, it's a complicated project. So by the 60s, we've, we see the consequences of fire exclusion and we have pushback and we start an era that will attempt to restore fire and will broaden uh, the political authority and powers of those responsible for fire. So we wanna get good fire back in and we want more than the forest service. And indeed we'll have more than just governmental agencies and the public domain will reflect this. It's going to go from a kind of multiple use melting pot to a special interest mosaic. And you can think of the Wilderness Act as the first of many rechartering. All of the federal lands will receive new charters or be given some organic acts for the first time. Each will want its own fire program and where they will have to be put together again. The revolution, I dated from 62 to 78. One side was in Florida. Uh, tall timbers helped to advertise this. It was dealing with working landscapes focused on prescribed fire. California promoted a different model, really dealing with wild landscapes, with public lands, particularly interested in natural fire. Use controlled fire, prescribed fire, but only insofar as necessary to create the conditions for natural fire. 62, Tall Timbers holds its first fire ecology conference, a major forum. And the Nature Conservancy conducts its first prescribed burn at a prairie in Minnesota. By 68, the National Park Service reformed its policy. By 78, the Forest Service did and restructured its entire agency in many ways to accommodate it. So we're not looking at anything new here, folks. We're looking at stuff that's 40 to 50 years old. These ideas are not new. The question is not necessarily one of policies, it's one of politics. It's one of implementing policies that were already around. So what were the policy? Basically, it was a policy of fire by prescription, controlled prescribed fire, sort of on a Florida model. But for those Westerners with large back countries and now wilderness, a natural fire or prescribed natural fire as it was called. And then for fire itself, no more 10 a.m. policy. Lots of flexibility is possible here. In a sense, almost all of the options which we're now exploiting in recent years were present 40 to 50 years ago. So I think the revolution ends, reaches its high water mark probably in 78. And then things uh, stall. We have basically a lost decade and a bit more. Um, the polarization that's so familiar today sets in beginning with weather. The early 80s were extraordinarily uh, wet. The late 80s were extraordinarily dry. And the West has stayed dry ever since. Politics begin polarizing, uh, conflict between civilian and military uh, funding and so forth set in by the Reagan administration, privatization, all kinds of other things that are still with us. And not least by the mid 80s, recognize something that we now call the wildland urban interface. Yeah, it's a klutzy name. I'm sorry we got it, but we seem to be stuck with it. But it's a way of characterizing what a recolonizing of once rural lands by essentially urbanites. And with that urban fire returns. Hey, we fixed urban fire. Our cities used to burn as often as the countryside. They were made of the same materials. They burned under the same winds. 
the same drought conditions. We fixed that. 1906, San Francisco took an earthquake. San Francisco burned since then. We don't have big urban fires anymore. We do now. They've come back. Add it all up, and I think of it as a kind of counter-revolution. Not enough to roll everything back, but enough to stall it. And the era ends with two extreme fires, and in a sense, on the two extreme landscapes, the sort of the purely wild and the urban, which has a, a boundary with open space or countryside uh, featured. So Yellowstone in 1988 and Oakland 1991 uh, coming back. And these are the two sort of defining frames uh, for, for the era to come. The revolution re rekindles uh, after uh, the 92 elections, uh, actually after the 94 fire at South Canyon that burned over a crew, a uh, mixed crew, and that got uh, people interested. Uh, Secretary of Interior Bruce Babbitt declares we have a national fire crisis. And in 2000, uh, despite efforts to restart everything, reboot it, um, we have wildfire back again in the Northern Rockies. Here we are, 90 years after the big blow up. All those planes and helicopters, all those engines, all those crews, all that science, all that communication device, all that equipment, we can't stop the fires. Meanwhile, the National Park Service uh, at Bandelier National Monument in Northern New Mexico starts a prescribed fire, which they lose and then burns into Los Alamos National Laboratory. Well, if you're gonna burn a community, don't burn a celebrity community, particularly one that has, that makes nukes and has lots of nasty stuff in the soils left over. Um, so it looked like we couldn't light fires or fight them effectively. And the fire community seemed to accept that it was in a major breakdown. Uh, the final days of the Clinton administration end with a national fire plan not too little too late. It may actually have been too much, too much to absorb usefully, but it was certainly too late. After this, everything is going to continue uh, along worsening conditions. So more large fires, they're now called mega fires, more communities burning and firefighters still being killed. So we spent basically 50 years trying to take all fire out of landscapes. And then we spent 50 years trying to put good fire back in. I think now we're segueing into something where the revolution, let's, call, let's give it that 50 year frame, seal it off and think about what comes next because I think we're into a different era and for lack of a better term, I'll call it resilience. 2009, again, uh, election policy changes new guidelines, interpreting policy, trying to get more good fire, less bad fire, loosening up what people can do with fires, um, followed by uh, the mandate for a national cohesive strategy, um, which didn't get any money, uh, didn't get any extra funding to do it, uh, didn't, wasn't given any political authority, basically a giant talk shop, but yet, yet useful and necessary. Uh, because the problem is, again, not just one of policy, but of politics. The American fire community now is vaster than it was in 1960. And no single agency or ruling authority uh, has control over it to bring all the parts into sync. We now have to deal with volunteer fire departments, county fire departments, fire districts, all of which are now first responders for wildland or wildland urban uh, fires. Uh, what about states? Uh, all of which have different, all of these have different mandates. We have a very active civil society, which is interested in fire. How do you bring all of these together? What we need is a kind of fire constitution that in my mind, a political arrangement, not just one of policy agreement. Anyway, that's where we are. Uh, the growth of a civil society is quite dramatic. National Coalition of Prescribed Fire Councils promoting fire um, at all levels. We're moving not just among federal agencies, but intergovernmental agencies and non-governmental agencies. There's even a landowner's right to burn uh, being, being argued. Well, we're not exactly into Second Amendment territory here, 
but there's a certain element of that perhaps behind it. And what about the nature conservancy? TNC now burns as much on an annual basis as the National Park Service. It is a significant player. Uh, and in some ways is taking the role the Forest Service once had of, of a kind of neutral broker uh, to help facilitate things. And in recent years, the return of tribal burning. Again, a different kind of restoration, in this case of cultural. So now we've got all kinds of competing interests, all kinds of players. How do we pull all these together? Is it even possible? So I'm going to conclude here by looking at three strategies that I think are in play, each of which represents these eras. It's called a resistance strategy. Hey, suppression is stronger than ever. Suppression never went away. And the development of communities, fringe communities now at risk from fire has made it stronger than ever. The problem is that there are strong pushes politically to make it a kind of all hazard emergency service. In effect, to take an urban fire model and extrapolate it into the countryside. And if you want a sample of what that could look like, think CAL FIRE. And Colorado is now trying a kind of CAL FIRE light model along the front range. And I think we can expect to see more of it. Uh, this may provide better protection for houses. There's no evidence that it, it, it manages fires on the countryside. Well, what about the last 50 years of the fire revolution? A restoration strategy still thriving. Uh, lots of efforts to uh, rehabilitate landscapes at scale so they can be fire can be reintroduced and we can create healthier landscapes uh, at the same time uh, promote <coughs> more fire adapted communities. <coughs> Very active uh, project. But again, nobody's shown it can be done at scale. We're falling behind each year in both both charges. And so now I think, you know, my, my sense over the last decade, I've had a chance to tour a lot of the country and talk to a lot of fire officers. I'm not sure that people on the ground believe we're going to get ahead of this problem. The old model with science tells us what to do and management applies it. Um, I think it's too late for that. The 70s and 80s were the last time all the ingredients were lined up in a way that we might have intervened and gotten attraction. I think we're looking at an era now of hybrids and mashups, uh, a lot of point protection, box and burn, using fires as opportunities to get uh, some good fire on the landscape. Here in the southwest where I am, I've, I've, there are lots of evidence of this. We're in a place that can do it and they're using it very successfully. They're using it elsewhere uh, too. Uh, this doesn't mean they're not protecting communities. They're using this to to provide the, the major force for community protection as far as they can. But for the rest of it, using these fires, doing extensive burnouts, if they do them well, it's really a kind of prescribed burning done under urgent conditions. It's not a, an emergency backfire. We could do it better, but this is how we're getting uh, fire on the land at scale. Well, most places it's like a game of rock, scissors, paper, which one, which one matters most at a particular time and place. There's no single strategy that's going to work. So let me, let me step back. I said I wasn't gonna do a global history, I won't, but I will do a slightly global turn here beyond the revolution, other conditions, and that's climate change, which is acting as a performance enhancer on all, everything we do. In fact, as a fire historian, I'll make the case that climate history is now a sub-narrative of fire history because it's our species monopoly over fire and our determination to burn fossil fuels as well as living landscapes or not burn living landscapes, that is what is behind us. So I'll go back to that Courier and Ice print. There we are, the world dividing in two thanks to industrial combustion or fossil fuel and look at two fire maps. Here's living landscapes. This was, uh, I think, 2012 from NASA, burned area. And here's CO2 emissions, which I think we can take as a good proxy for fossil fuels. And that's what the map looks like. These maps do not coincide. They are inverted. 
Where you have one, you don't have the other. Uh, and as you go into finer scales, you can see this, and this works out globally. You can see, look at earth at night lights between industrial lights and uh, uh, landscape burning lights. Uh, this is what we've done. And this for me is part of the driver behind our current conditions. Well, mega fires have now joined our forlorn polar bear as an emblem of climate change and indeed the Anthropocene. But I would argue it's larger than that. It's not just burning fossil fuels, it's a fossil fuel civilization, uh, which determines how we use land, not just and climate change, but all kinds of other ecological pathologies, even the ability to exclude fire. If we took away all our fossil fuel machines, we couldn't pretend to fight fires. We would have to do what people have always done, which is to manipulate the landscape and burn. Even our prescribed burns, we're using drip torches outfitted with gasoline and diesel. Um, a lot of it delivered by uh, ATVs uh, or helicopters or other devices. We are, we are a fossil fuel civilization and now we have to ratchet that down. But as we ratchet down our fossil fuel burning, we're gonna be ratcheting up our burning of living landscapes. We can see lots of ways where these two fire realms are colliding. I, my favorite is power line fires. Uh, extraordinary number of our most damaging fires have been up, and we can expect a lot, a lot of uh, exotic landscapes, odd combinations to come. Well, we already had a fire crisis in the 1960s and 70s, but now I think when you add up all the things we're doing with fire, we're creating a fire epoch or what I've taken to calling a pyrocene. We are creating the fire informed equivalent of an ice age. And I think that is where the fire story is going. It is going global. A final thought, the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, I think got it right. They shall go out from one fire and another fire shall devour them. We're always going to be caught between fires. That's, that's the human condition. So with that, uh, I've said enough. Let's open it up to, uh, let's open it up to the others. And thank you for your, your time and attention. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, I forgot to say at the beginning, and I noticed one person did put in a question in the chat box, but, um, um, I, and I urge, other, I urge you now, uh, if you have a question as it comes to mind, as you were listening to Steve, jot it in the chat box right now and we'll come to it, okay? And then, um, Nils, do you, uh, Carrie, do you want to say a, a few words now about uh, local conditions and how they might spin off of uh, Steve's talk? Sure, I can go ahead. Um, hi all, my name is Carrie Kemp and I am a forest ecologist with the Nature Conservancy here in Oregon. And I have been in my position here in Northeast Oregon for about six years, but prior to that, I did a PhD in fire ecology um, at the University of Idaho and um, studied post-fire regeneration across the, the Northern Rockies and especially looking at the interaction between um, fire conditions as developed under you know, fire suppression and climate change on impacting regeneration. So um, just a couple quick comments from to build off of Dr. Pine's presentation. Um, it's obvious we live in a fire environment, especially here in the West and sustaining fire dependent ecosystems while reducing risks to people is gonna require this really these really collaborative solutions that prepare communities to live safely with fire while restoring those kind of backcountry areas that Dr. Pine talked about the, the forest to be more resilient in the face of future, clim future climate and future fires. Um, and also we know that, that natural disturbances like fire don't respect ownership boundaries. And so we really need to invest in working with interest groups and partners across boundaries to accomplish restoration and conservation outcomes at scales larger than those that are just managed by a single organization 
or agency. So here in Oregon, the Nature Conservancy um, works with partners across many of our fire adapted forest landscapes to help employ an appropriate set of tools based on the unique risks and needs in each geography to move us towards these more resilient landscapes, um, more fire adapted communities, and a safe and effective wildfire response, which kind of integrates all those three strategies that Dr. Pine talked about at the end of his presentation, both um, resistance, restoration, and resilience. And we really recognize that effective solutions are gonna to have to marry ecological, economic, and social perspectives. Um, so I just wanna highlight one um, recent development in Northeast Oregon that's really exciting to me and many of the partners on this call um, which is that our collaborative efforts in, in this part of the state were recently recognized with the funding of a new um, collaborative forest landscape restoration proposal. Sorry for the background email noises here. Um, but CFLRPs, this program has been in place for um, over 10 years now. And um, it brings dedicated funding to federal forests to do restoration work. And in particular, the CFLRP in Northeast Oregon is focused on kind of these restoration and resilience strategies that Dr. Pine talked about. Um, so we're really focused on, on helping adapt our communities and working to um, develop strategic treatments in places that reduce the risk of fire transmission into the WUI and creating strategic fuel breaks um, to help limit kind of the, the spread and give our fire managers, um, firefighters more options when fires do occur. But the, the overarching principle under this um, proposal and, and this work is that we want to create the opportunity for more beneficial fire on the landscape over the long term. So we want to set the landscape up for more fire um, in that hybrid approach that Dr. Pine talked about. So focusing specifically on strategic treatments in places where we know um, communities are at risk and then creating opportunities for our firefighters, our line officers in the Forest Service um, to have more decision space to manage fires when they actually occur. Um, so just, I would just say some really neat opportunities and developments here in Northeast Oregon. Um, I'm happy to talk more about those as folks have questions, but I don't wanna take up too much time. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to or back to Rich. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Again, people, um, go ahead and use the chat box now, although we've got about, I don't know, 25 or 30 of us here, and it eventually we'll just open it up and you can wave a hand or sort of. But Nick, do you, uh, do you have anything, do you wanna jump in here right now with uh, some comments from your own experience and how it fits in? You, your career kind of matched a lot of uh, Steve's presentation as I was watching it. Unmute yourself, Steve, or uh, Nick. Okay, here we go. Uh, yeah, I uh, started working for the Forest Service in 1971 and retired uh, from my full-time day job in 2007. So I covered a lot of that period um, and it was really interesting getting his uh, historical perspective on that, uh, that I lived. Um, and when I started out, um, well, I, I uh, worked my way through college, graduated from Oregon State with a degree in forest management in 1975. And my career has been in Oregon and Washington, uh, four national forests. And I, but I came here and 1989 on the Wolof Whitman National Forest in Enterprise. And I was managing timber at the time, but all through my career, I've been active in uh, fire management, fire suppression. 
uh, most of the prescribed burning that I'd been involved with before I got here was uh, burning activity fuels, uh, slash burning logging slash basically pile burning and and broadcast burning and clear cuts. And when I moved here, got into more of the uh, uneven aged management and started getting involved in putting fire on the ground uh, in some extent to still deal with logging slash, but also we started doing more prescribed burning on the landscape, uh, trying to deal with some of that backlog of fuels and also got involved in wilderness uh, fire. Uh, natural ignitions as well as uh, management ignited fire in the Eagle Cap wilderness. I think we were the first forest in the region to do management ignited fire um, in wilderness starting in 1995 with the mine and backbone. And then that transformed into the uh, Minum 2 project and, and that was larger in scale. I had some really good results with that. But I've also, in my career, been involved with uh, type two incident management teams. I was an operations chief and uh, incident commander and deputy incident commander clear up until 2015 when I finally hung it up after the birth of my first grandson and decided there were more important things in life than 45 fire seasons and going for 50. Um, but the things that I observed Starting about 1994, is it fires started getting a lot harder to predict and a lot harder to deal with. Um, just in terms of, we were like the first half of my career, we never dealt with structures, except maybe an isolated lookout or guard station someplace that we needed to protect. Well, by 2000, we had put structure protection specialists on our teams, and we were constantly having to prioritize protecting structures as opposed to looking at the, the larger fire and, and dealing with it uh, in more of a, an ecologically sensitive way. And I've got a lot of experience using the mixed, you know, suppression here, confinement here, containment over there, uh, because of the landscape that I worked on here with the wilderness, had a lot of fires in Hell's Canyon that you couldn't just go direct on. You had to back off six or eight miles and then take you three days to get a line down a ridge um, to and burn it out to try to, to contain the fire. And we'd go 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 acre fires pretty routinely. Um, and then the last year that I did fire, I saw the, well, not just the last year, probably the last three to four years that I, I worked with the team after I'd retired and was still active with my fire team. I started seeing fire behavior like I had never seen before. And I, I got into a conversation with an old fire management officer that I had worked for on the, on the Wenatchee National Forest back in the 70s. And we were speculating. And what we've concluded in our, you know, what we've been able to observe, I, I don't have a lot of science behind it, but just what it looked to me like is that with the, the accumulative drought, we were seeing live fuels behaving like dead fuels. And so with live fuel moisture so low, it's, it's even in areas where fire was burning into places that had been thinned and burned and treated. Uh, I remember the last fire I was on, I was talking with the operations chief, uh, Steve Hawkins, and he's on the call right now. Uh, be interested to get his perspective, but it was a fire down around Unity, Oregon, burning north. And 
when we got dispatched, I was talking to him on the phone and he said, Nick, I think, I think we can catch this thing because it's burning into, said, I've been spent my whole career. I've, I've got 17,000 acres of fuel treatments out ahead of this fire. I think we got a chance. And in one burning period, it went clear through those fuel treatments over the ridge and down to, to the, the Baker Highway, uh, Highway 7, uh, right over Dooley Mountain, which had burned in 1989, burned through it again. And it was just like, holy cow, where'd that come from? Uh, well, it was wind driven and it was low humidity and cumulative drought. And it was like, wow. Um, and I went back there a few years ago for the, uh, the total solar eclipse. And we were up on top of this mountain looking down into, into that fire. And I'll tell you, it was a moonscape down there. Um, it was just incredible. So, I mean, that's the kind of challenges that we're facing and, and trying to do these hybrid things in the middle of August uh, under these extreme drought conditions. I, you know, it's really tough. <laughs> it's really tough. And even if you've got those treatments ahead of time, I, I'm beginning to wonder if maybe we're, to, you know, too late. I, I'd love to get some other perspectives on that. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Steve, you want to respond to that? Or are we too late? Well, okay. I was uh, thinking about that just a minute, guys. I got to confess, I'm double dipping on meetings here. Okay, so um, I would say that um, the, the days that burn were um, above the 100th percentile weather. So that set a new standard for weather for us. Um, and it did burn through all those. I, I will say that um, we looked at uh, 8,000 acres of fuels treatment and they all did what they were supposed to do. They took uh, fire from the crown to the ground in the treatments. And uh, in most of them, we had uh, pretty good results as far as even survivability. We did learn some stuff that, that if you're on steep ground, that uh, crown spacing, uh, doing understand uh, removals is not the tool to use on steep ground. You got to, things have got to be wide and open. And so uh, I think there was some learning things there. I, I, um, I'm a firm believer in a prescribed fire in the areas where we had prescribed fire out there. We uh, had little to no uh, fire burn through those thousands of acres. It, you know, there's a green islands that are out there. We got a lot of criticism burning those the first couple times because they've been burned two or three times already. Um, where we knocked holes in the stands and they're easily seen from the highway. Um, so, uh, but in the, the end result, those are the only stands that are still green out there. So I still believe that doing fuel treatments is appropriate. Although um, people's expectations of, uh, you know, uh, fuel treatments don't stop fires. They, they change fire, um, they change the fire behavior. And the other thing we had going on out there was uh, we had, uh, I think we had three engines and a dozer for that day up on the fire because there was fire all over the West at that time. And so we were low priority because we weren't burning into uh, cities or towns in Washington, which was going on at the same time. So no aircraft, really limited resources out there as well. So, um, but uh, yeah, so as far as that instance goes, uh, yeah, I was I was shocked on on that we we couldn't do better, but I was a little frustrated too that we didn't have anything to work with either while we were out there. Um, and uh, it, I don't know that it would have changed a large amount. It had the fire had a pretty good run at the fuel treatments. It wasn't like it started and burned through them. It it was several miles across when it entered into the national forest. So um, you know you. But I, I was uh, looking at hindsight on what we'd done. I think we'd still done the right thing. Just uh, expectations need to be realistic on what, what that actually buys you, I guess. Yeah, I still, I still wonder if even if we'd had the toys to play with on that particular day with those over um, the record setting ERCs and, and burning conditions, if it would have done much good. So Steve Pine, do you want to respond to that? What, I mean, you used the word megafires in your, uh, in your presentation there once or twice. And uh, somebody replied in the chat box now that, uh, that uh, another firefighter that we're seeing things that are entirely new and different uh, in terms of fire intensity. Um, 
is next question are we too late on some of this stuff well uh i hope not uh first of all i I'd say on megafires we've been through a cycle of megafires that lasted about 50 years 19th early 20th century so we've we've been through that that was driven almost wholly by fuels we're at the end of the little ice age you only need small climatic windows to get the fine fuels dry enough and so forth. Um, so it, it's certainly, pot, we have some experience. The problem with the climate change we're seeing now is that uh, it's not just reaching a new plateau, it's going to continue until we, we wrap it up. So we're going to be doing this for a long time. This is a, a rolling project. Uh, there's, no, there's no clear end and we need to be prepared for that. Um, I also think, I, I do think that the public has a lot of uh, frequently poor understanding of what prescribed fire means. They think, oh, good fire in place of bad fire, we're vaccinating the landscape and now it won't, it won't get sick. Well, it's much more like a flu shot uh, and you're gonna have to do it in perpetuity. There's no end to it. And it may not mean you don't get sick, it may mean you don't die, but it's that kind of, the analogies are very helpful, but not always uh, instructive, and sometimes they can come back on us. Um, I, I have to believe it's not too late. Uh, it's too late to have affected the revolution that we thought was going to happen 50 years ago. That time has passed. We're into a new set of circumstances. But I've got children. I've got grandchildren. I mean, I quit teaching when my oldest grandkid uh, was ready for college. I said, okay, this is, I'm, this is too much. I've got to quit. Uh, if I make average life expectancy, I'll, I'll probably have great grandchildren. And I, I have to believe that they can make something out of the world we're leaving them that's better than what we're leaving. So, and if you, you know, I also believe in the power of, um, of sort of prophecy, if you if you say that nothing can be done, you do nothing because what's the point? So you have to believe in a kind of self fulfilling prophecy that we can do something. I'm pretty confident it won't happen the way we th we think or want, but we can salvage enough to leave something for for that future. And with that, I've I, one other thought on the local the local scene. Um, I didn't get to deal a lot with uh, your part of the world. Uh, on this. I, I basically looked at Nancy Langston's book. I mean, the Blue Mountains area was the poster child for forest health issues. And how did we understand it? And I was just tired of irony. We've got to have another endpoint than irony, which is basically what professional historians and intellectuals make it. But the other, the other thing that came out of my experience in the Northwest was how much fire was tied with the ax, either for good or ill. And it doesn't seem that you can break that linkage. And at some point, uh, you've got to find a place for both, for both to interact. So with that, let me let me back off and let others in okay. the audience. So maybe Carrie or Nels want to say something about um, how much um, uh, the whole climate, weather and climate is coming into your planning and your work now. Carrie, do you, you want to pick up on that or you want to pass off to Nils? Sure, um, I, can, I can make a few comments. I think, you know, it's, we know that um, with increased temperatures, drier summers, we're going to see more area burned in the future. And with more area burned, more areas likely to burn severely or, intensely and um, that pattern has certainly played out um, in recent decades. We've seen that across fires in the Blue Mountains and in Oregon in the West. Um, but I think we're also entering into, into kind of a unique territory where the, the landscapes that we think about that, are, um, that aren't frequent fire landscapes. So those like Western Oregon that traditionally would have had fire um, less frequently, maybe on the order of uh, every hundred years or um, every couple hundred years in some of those 
those Western Cascades landscapes um, are, are likely to become a lot more vulnerable. And, and so um, those landscapes in the past have been what we call climate limited. And so what that means is that they have ample fuel always available to burn. They're very productive. Uh, they're very dense forest, but you need this, um, this alignment of the right climate conditions for those fuels to dry out enough to actually ignite and carry fire. And um, I think what we're seeing now with some projections, and certainly this has been our experience in, in recent years, is that we're going to have those climate conditions happening more frequently. Um, those unique combination of extreme events happening more frequently. And so we're going to see fire in places where we don't necessarily expect it, or we haven't learned to live with it in the same way that we have, for example, in Eastern Oregon, in these landscapes that were really fire dependent historically. Um, and so I think that's going to require a lot of different thinking and a lot of different planning. I would say it is a little difficult to know um, how we should plan for the future because we don't know exactly what the future is going to bring. But I think you know a lot of our thinking around this work in, in fire adaptive landscapes has been that if we can restore conditions to those that were emblematic of um, historic conditions, we will have a better chance at making those landscapes and our communities more resilient to fire. And that's because these landscapes evolved with fire, with a lot of fire over millennia. Um, and so I think that's still the direction we're, we're moving with kind of a lack of um, better understanding of exactly how and where fires are going to occur in the future, that, that part of the planning is, it's completely unpredictable. Um, but I do think we also need to start to plan to have more fire in landscapes that we might not have expect fire or that our human condition isn't as evolved to expect fire in the future. Nels, you want to add to that? Uh, um, uh, maybe just briefly, you know, I think um, touching back on some of the stuff uh, Stephen Pine mentioned at the beginning, um, there's, a, there's definitely a recognition that um, over the last century plus, our, uh, the, uh, all the factors Stephen Pine mentioned have affected the landscape, um, affected both the, the conditions uh, driving fire and the consequences of those fires. And then on top of that, we have um, uh, predicted hotter, drier, Summers, longer fire seasons. We're seeing it in Wallowa County. Um, just, just the other day, ODF and W uh, was. Uh, I mean, th this is actually from Union County, from Starkey Research Station, but uh, documenting over the last thirty years um, a uh, reduction in in forage quality due to a shorter. Um, growing season because of higher temperatures and lower lower moisture of forage and forbs, and we're seeing all this combined and trying to understand you know what is that what is that going to mean on fire in this landscape, and and given the fact that we did not react sooner, um, you know as Kerry said we're and I think it's it's not just like that we don't think. Uh, I mean, it's also just accepting with a little more humility about our place in the world and the landscape um, that uh, we don't control everything. Uh, and, and, and what is it based on uh, the factors that we understand and the values we want to protect, uh, what actions seem to be appropriate? 
and and that's what we're trying to work through. So in you know in Willowa County, um, we've got people working on the ground in Lostine and up around Willowa Lake with Firewise communities that Stephen Pine mentioned. Uh, we're working with the Forest Service and ODF and NRCS and private landowners and the Forest Service on these adjacent near country uh, forest restoration projects. And then looking sort of at the larger landscape about um, where, where would treatment assist in reducing risk or reducing consequence, uh, recognizing we're never eliminating fire, we're gonna be living with fire uh, in the future, but, but hopefully we have sort of that a return in balance from these very large mega fires, large events uh, that have, um, you know, as much consequence to the economy and to human health from smoke or more than the direct effects of fire. You know, how do we move from that to potentially more frequent, smaller, low intensity fires? Uh, because we've uh, set up the forest to sort of return to uh, a pre-settlement fire condition that allows it to burn more frequently, less intensively with more of a mosaic, a more mixed pattern of, uh, of, of hotter cold and colder fires. That, that's kind of what we're aiming for. Um, a lot of work to be done. You know, the one nice thing that's happening in the Northern Blues is that there's more federal funding coming in from both NRCS and the Forest Service from the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program that Stephen Pine mentioned, as well as from the Farm Bill uh, to support the Northern Blues All Lands Restoration Project, which is 10 million acres that is trying to align large landscape treatment um, across boundaries, as Kerry said, because fire doesn't recognize those boundaries. Looking at the Willow Whitman National Forest, Umatilla National Forest, adjacent private land, and, and working with uh, the Nez Perce tribe, the Confederated tribes of the Umatillas, and the Warm Springs Nation to try to line up like, how do we collectively look at this landscape? How do we collectively look at the values uh, that the various owners and people have? And, and, and how do we do things that's you know, bigger than just the individual properties, goals and objectives, but putting each individual within sort of the community and the landscape as a whole. So that, that's what we're working on uh, and, and just really getting kick, kicked off this summer. Thank you, Nils. Um, I see Matt Howard's on here and Matt, uh, not to put you on the spot, but from the, uh, from, from, from the working primarily with private lands with ODF and W, uh, what do you see in terms of uh, changes in your career and directions we're going now and some of the preceding conversation? You got to unmute yourself. There you go. You got me now? Okay. You know, I've got, I'm not as long in the tooth as Mr. Lundy there, but I'm seeing some of the same things that he's seeing. For sure. You know, my career started in the, the later 80s with, uh, with going into fire. Um, you know, I don't think there's a silver bullet out there. I don't, I don't know if we, if we stop climate change, I don't know if we, uh, put out all the fires. I don't know if we let the fires go, if we treat every acre in the forest. I don't know that there's one thing out there that's going to help. I think it's a combination of, uh, circumstances that has got us where we're at. You know, you could look at, uh, you know, the environmental protections and the lack of treatment in the woods you know, for 40 some years, has that uh, been a negative or a, or a positive consequence? I think you could probably argue that either way. The fact is these, these fires are burning hotter, uh, longer. They're more resistant to control. We have, you know, as Nick mentioned, there's, there's more people in the woods now, uh, more people living in the woods uh, than, than in past times. And that, you know, that's going to exa exasperate our control efforts. You know, we fight fire a bit different when there's people involved. You know, uh, Dr. Pine talked about point protection uh, for sure. 
last fall, Labor Day fires, that's about all uh, we were doing for a good amount of time was point protection on these fires. So it, it, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it, it's been a good career to be in as a wildland firefighter. Uh, you know, I think we need to, personally, I think we need to continue manipulating the, the forest as best we can from a mechanical means and through the use of fire, uh, both with prescribed fire um, and, you know, what the Forest Service is proposing from, you know, promoting natural fire uh, in, in the right circumstances, whether it's in the wilderness or out in the national forest, you know, as long as it's not impacting, negatively impacting uh, a private landowner, then I think we're, we're good to go. Uh, there's, I've yet to meet a private landowner in Palau County that cares to have fire on the ground in July or August. So, and that's generally when we get our, our natural ignitions. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think we need to, we need to recognize the, the concerns and the values that people have for their private property. And I know folks do, uh, and we need to recognize the values, concerns people have for public lands, which uh, I think the fact is we're not gonna, we're not gonna please everybody. And if we think we're gonna please everybody, we're fooling ourselves. I think we, the, we, the best we can do is what's out there in front of us, uh, you know, from a civil cultural aspect. And I go back to, you know, the definition, I learned of civil culture in, in forestry schools, the art and science of managing trees. And that's, you know, we need to let our foresters manage trees and, and a lot of it's science and some of it's art as well and allowing those foresters to make decisions out there. And they're gonna make good decisions and they're gonna make poor decisions. It's just, uh, we need to allow folks to do uh, their, their job out there as they're trained. Uh, unfortunately, perception is reality. And there's some folks out there that are very vocal against some of the things that science and our foresters are really promoting. And uh, it, it just ties our hands. So it's a very rewarding career. It's a very frustrating part of our job as I'm sure most professions have. Thank you, Matt. Um, if I could jump in for a second, um, this is Nick. I, I think one of the biggest challenges ahead in moving forward in, in setting things up to be more successful in the future and, and to have a positive impacts on the landscape is adjusting public expectations. Um, I ran into a lot of unrealistic expectations of what we could do and from the public, from agency administrators, um, from, you know, county commissioners, those kinds of people. And, and when I was, after I retired, I was the deputy incident commander on our team. And so my job was working with, with all of those people and, and trying to get them to, to realize um, what was possible and what was not possible under the conditions that we were on in. And I see that as a real challenge. Um, it's, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of years of, of expectations that you can come in and, and be more effective than what the conditions are allowing us to be. Uh, during the peak of the burning season. And I know with, with the work that Nils has been doing with the Firewise communities and, and some of those other initiatives that he talked about, I think that's our greatest hope in, in working with all the various uh, public and um, different diverse groups of people that have a stake in how fire is managed on a landscape. Um, the more people you can bring in on various sides of it, I think that's the greatest hope for, for making some progress here. But I ran into a lot of unrealistic expectations of, uh, and, and even just explaining to some people what's possible and what's not possible is, is very difficult uh, because of, preconceived notions and, and emotions. Uh, when you get into a situation with, with a lot of smoke and flame in the air, uh, emotions run rampant and it's, it's hard, to, hard to, uh, to deal with those things. 
Thank you, Nick. Uh, Mike Ng is asking a couple questions there, which kind of follow on some of what you and Matt were talking about. Um, uh, he asked Steve Pine specifically about resilience strategy and whether land use planning might, what the role for that is in it. And uh, also asked about, uh, this is one I've wondered about too, whether insurance, uh, insurance companies are ultimately going to help us uh, limit some of that uh, rural urban inter interface that you guys have had to be dealing with. So some, uh, Steve Pine or anybody else who wants to pick up on that. Well, you... Since he named me, I'll start. Yeah, I mean, that's fundamental. Uh, I mean, there are only a few strategies available for managing fire, grand strategies, and land use. Uh, in general is is a classic one. I mean, that's basically what Europe has historically done. They've controlled fire by close cultivation of the landscape. Uh, we're not inclined to do that. So uh, we have to come up with other strategies, including substituting our fires for nature's uh, and so forth. Um, I'm not very sanguine about the market uh, helping us on this. Uh, the, market's, the market is only interested in large clusters of burned houses that are high value. And their solution is, is to just hire private security oh. fires people oh. to provide protection, just reduce the public thing together. Uh, and again, we can look at our, this, how did fires, uh, how did we control fire in cities, wh which routinely burned for so long? It wasn't because of insurance. It was fundamentally a political decision that there is a certain base level of public safety uh, that is required. These are standards, these are codes. Uh, we are putting this in and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll create a box for the market to operate in. But leaving it to the market didn't, didn't help. In fact, uh, fire insurance, you had to have fires for people to buy insurance. They wouldn't buy it unless there were fires. And then you get a big fire and the company goes bankrupt. So nobody gets paid. I mean, it was hopeless. It was a market failure in a large scale. So the cities provide, I think, a model for that now. And I'm sorry to say that ultimately, if you're serious about protecting communities today, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to make a political decision about land use and standards. And I would say right now, I'm not very uh, optimistic about that. In many ways, I mean, look at look at our national response to the pandemic. I mean, it's been you know it's hopelessly fractured uh, in many ways. In many ways, I mean, fire is very much like a virus. It's not living, but it feeds on a living landscape. It spreads by the same way. Wearing masks to prevent aerosol spread is a, is pretty much like uh, hardening houses against embers. Uh, social distancing is pretty much like defensible space. Bird immunity is pretty much like having enough of the community respond that you provide protection uh, for everyone. And uh, I don't see that happening in the absence at scale, in the absence of a political, uh, some kind of legislative and enforced mandate. And I don't see us in a position to, to produce that kind of political answer. Well, if I could just well, I, follow I, it's up. Probably, it's probably going to look, the response to preventing, to protecting communities is going to be pretty much like our COVID response. A few places will get it, a lot of places won't be very mixed. One, one uh, just quick follow up, uh, this Mike. Um, we're hearing that um, some folks that live up in, a, in, in the wildland urban interface are having difficulty getting homeowners insurance. And um, we're also curious to see if some uh, of the larger uh, underwriters um, may require uh, that a community become, for instance, a firewise community in order to for them to insure them. I mean, State Farm is, a, is the corporate uh, sponsor of firewise, and it certainly seems like they may be heading in that direction, both in terms of um, uh, fire resistant building materials in the building stage, um, but, but then also uh, uh, being part of a larger community to uh, kind of prepare and prevent um, uh, risk of wildfire. 
Uh, so this is Norm Simone. I'd just like to emphasize that Oregon, in fact, has comprehensive land use planning. It's the best tool we have. We need to use it. We need to enforce it. We need to make sure that we support the Land Use Board of Appeals. All of that gives us what I think is probably the most powerful uh, set of tools for limiting the kind of damage that looks to be inevitable. We've got a couple of uh, Alaska people here. Uh, do, does Alaska uh, differ? Is that a whole different, is that a different book? Randy or John, do you want to expound on that a little bit? Is that a model that's, uh, that's applicable here or is it a different situation entirely? Unmute, Randy. You're still muted. Oh, well, we have any other Alaskans there? Is Alaska a different story? Or while we're waiting for Randy, uh, John Marshall, uh, you haven't uh, you haven't said much uh, so far, but in your meanderings around the Northwest and photographing uh, uh, the countryside, um, what do you see in terms of uh, the kind of efforts that Nels and Kerry were talking about and the impacts they might be having? Well, there are some, um, some good efforts uh, going on. Um, it's just at a at a landscape scale. It's it's not enough um, that we're doing some good things uh, here and there, uh, but on the whole, um, there's just so much landscape uh, that's untreated and uh, has continuity of fields and um, uh, you know it's it's kind of like we're we're poking the bear, but we're not poking them hard enough. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about listening to Steve Pine's presentation, uh, you know, that kind of 50 years uh, starting in 1960, where they began to recognize that fire uh, was, was a good, um, that uh, really the amount of acreage of uh, fire where we decided it was a better thing to let it burn or at least burn to the next road or ridge um, isn't very much. And um, uh, as I see it, uh, uh, fire is a social problem. Uh, we've got the, the science figured out pretty well, but we can't get people to do what needs to be done. Uh, and um, uh, I don't think that we're doing nearly enough prescribed burning. I think prescribed burning is great, but we have to be so darn careful uh, because it's on us if it gets away that we, uh, we, we don't do much acreage. Uh, and um, I see a lot of opportunities being missed for more of what we call managed wildfire, or I forget what the latest buzzword is for it, but basically it's uh, under some conditions, let the fire burn at least to some point. Um, and um, I, I, I feel like every year, there's a lot of missed opportunity where we could have gotten a lot more acres of good fire and we're not doing it. And the reason is not because the fire professionals don't want to do it, it's because the public won't accept it. Um, that, uh, to give you a good example, down in Grant County in 2019, um, the uh, 206 Cal Fire uh, was an example of good fire. Um, they could have put it out easy early on. Instead, they let it come down to the road where they prepped the road and put it out there. It did a really good thing, but they got a lot of grief from the local community. 
and um, you know, which goes back to uh, it's a it's a social problem, it's an educational problem, um, and it can't be solved by agencies alone, and it's huge. And so I'll end with that. <laughs> Thank you, John. Hey, Randy, did you get your thing going? Nope, I don't know if she did. I, I think what he was saying there about social is what Kerry was saying about public, um, public uh, uh, perception and knowledge of fires. So I guess we've got some good agreement there. Getting it, uh, I'm gonna dig, since I'm the total non-science guy here, the non-forestry guy, but I do sitting on outside, I know that one of the places at which we get um, at, at which we get a confrontation is between uh, is when you start talking about mechanical treatment and uh, mechanical treatment. And right now in the West side in, in Oregon, we've got a big hassle over uh, uh, how many uh, hazard trees are being taken down from uh, last year's fires along the roads. And uh, that's, that's, it's a big controversy. They're going to, they're going to examine it. So what, what's, what's going to happen next there? Anybody want to take that on? Okay. Well, you know, it's just another example of, um, uh, different expectations in the public. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to weigh on whether what they're doing is too much or not enough because I don't have enough information on it. But um, it's just another example of someone's vision is someone else's disaster. And, um, you know, we're going to encounter that forever, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, somebody here. Hey, Rich, I, Rich, I think uh, I think John and Randy would like Stephen Pine to give them a weigh in on their question about Alaska versus the lower forty-eight. Okay. Stephen, Steve Pine, do you want to address Alaska? Sure, why not? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Alaska is different. Uh, yeah. You know, so is Texas, but Alaska matters more, I think. Uh, it's in many ways on the front lines of a lot of climate change. It had a chance with uh, legislation, the Alaska Lands Act, uh, and resolving native claims that by 1980, really, right as the fire revolution had reached its climax, it was able to start over in ways that other agencies in the lower 48 were not. So it's been much more cooperative. Uh, it, it doesn't have the dispersed kind of communities we have elsewhere, although it has lots of small cabins and sites and other things often tied to native claims that they have to provide protection. So it's not just a let it burn. What I think uh, I find interesting about where the Alaska model could be um, transferred uh, elsewhere is in the cooperative mode that they've evolved, but that's becoming in the backcountry or what I've come to call a kind of box and burn strategy. And I think there are, there are two versions of this, which we've been using uh, since really the 60, late 60s. And one is a kind of passive monitoring it's a natural event in a natural area, we'll watch it. And then if it exceeds the conditions we have allowed, we will put it back in the box. I think that model has generally failed or rather it works great until it doesn't. And then it fails, it can fail on a huge scale. Um, and it's a big mess when it does. Uh, it also causes problems I think with smoke 
because you're, you're liable. The perception of the public is that you're just watching it. You're letting it burn. I think the alternative that I've seen work successfully in the Southwest and some other places is a much more active engagement with the fire that you are pushing and pulling that fire where you want it to go. You're working with the fire. You're kind of loose herding it. You're putting down fire here. Maybe you're cutting a line there. You're opening a road here. You're burning out. It may take several weeks to complete the burnout, but you are systematically engaged with that fire. You put, you put up boundary conditions, not only spatially, but temporally. And you can say, here is what we're doing. Here is where the smoke is going to be a problem, then it's going away. We are not just going to let this go, even if it's late in the season, because late in the season it gets cold, which means you're going to have inversions. The inversions are going to go in the valleys, which is where the people are. So my, my sense is that we need to think much more proactively about this kind of fire and think about the burnouts as a kind of prescribed burning. You know, they used to have pre-attack plans Where's where we go if the fire escapes? We should have pre-burn plans for most of these forests. Where do we go and under what conditions do we operate and how do we do it? So it is not, it is more like a prescribed burn than an emergency backfire. I think at that point, if you are actively engaged with the public, they can understand it. You're not just watching it. You've got stuff, you're, you're doing stuff with it. And the other thing, I, I hate to wade in on the nor Northwest quarrel between fire and ax and all of this stuff. But I'll put in a word for the Nature Conservancy that it provides a different model than either a wilderness or wholesale private commodity production. That it's an active engagement with the landscape, but for ecological goods and services, not just for board feet and you know, animal units. And that is something that I think would be easier to sell to the public. And it's probably the model we need for the future, some adaptation of that. Hey, Jeff Fields. I would. You going to respond to that, Jeff Fields? We got a TNC guy on here. <laughs> you want to talk, Jeff, or not? I think you're Gary, very, Gary might be able to respond to that, Rich. Okay. Yeah, or Terry. Well, I, I appreciate the recognition of TNC's role in, um, in, in managing fires on landscapes. It's something that our organization has done for, for decades. Um, and I think, you know, across our, our preserves, um, we're really, we're really trying to not only implement um, practices like prescribed burning, but, but use our, our preserves as almost as living land laboratories or demonstration landscapes for some of these techniques to see how they could be applied on a broader scale. And so for example, you know, in, in Oregon, um, we have a large preserve in South Central Oregon, the Saikan Marsh Preserve, which has a lot of dry forest, ponderosa pine, um, ponderosa pine forest on it. And um, for years, we've been hosting researchers um, at the preserve that are, you know, come from a variety of different research institutions. Um, and, and their research is really dedicated to thinking about how we improve our understanding of how prescribed fire alters um, natural fire behavior. But also we work in partnership down there with the Fremont Wynema National Forest um, to carry out prescribed fire controlled burns on, on TNC and Forest Service lands. And, and this is where we are really able to demonstrate how this can operationally work across boundaries on a larger landscape. Um, so I think, you know, there's an important role we can play as an organization in helping um, create some science that helps support these, these types of efforts, but also um, demonstrates how there can be successful partnerships between organizations. 
And just one other comment um, I was going to make on the question about Alaska and fire management in Alaska is that I think there's, and, and Dr. Pine pointed to this, but there's dramatic differences in um, social perceptions and also in, um, I guess, the, the decision space or the, the opportunity in different landscapes to manage fires. And so, for example, in, in Alaska, as, as Dr. Pine alluded to, you have these large wild landscapes um, where you can essentially do point protection of the few structures that are out there and, and kind of allow fires to play a natural role. Um, and in the Southwest, I think you also have a unique situation where um, fire managers have a little bit more decision space to actually um, manage fires or, or do the push and pull and kind of um, the, the working with the fire with a natural ignition to expand it because their active fire season is um, early in the summer and it's and generally it's followed by these monsoon rains and so they get a lot of their natural ignitions in May and June and then they're followed by these monsoon rains in July and August and so they have you know they have some confidence that um, they have a hard a hard stop to that fire season that they'll have the ability to use or work with weather and the natural conditions to kind of manage those fires. Um, and I think in the Pacific Northwest, we have, we have a different situation that makes it more challenging. As I think um, Matt might have alluded to earlier, you know, our natural ignitions in this landscape happen in July and August. And so if you're thinking about managing a fire that starts naturally in July, you have to think about it burning until possibly October. And that's a long period of time. And there's a lot can, that can happen in that period of time. And we just have, I think we also have a different frame of mind born from a history of being a timber production region in the Pacific Northwest that um, has, has in some cases changed the way that we changed our fire culture in this region relative to other regions. And so I, I think, you know, there are a lot of important differences regionally in the way that, that we have the ability to manage fire, but also in the way that people think about fire um, and perceive fire on the landscape. I, I'm gonna jump in here because there's a question about, uh, about tribal involvement and I'm, uh, I think about, I think more broadly in Steve's remarks, he was talking about the Nature Conservancy kind of a multiple, multiple use management. And in other words, the Nature Conservancy here has grazing on it. And, you know, you've got, you're not just producing animal units, you're not just producing timber, but you're producing a whole bunch of different things, including Indian people coming up to dig roots this weekend. Um, and which gets you to the tribal thing. And I, I, the, the uh, Umatilla tribe has done a series on climate change and they, and I was hoping she'd be with, with us today, their forester, uh, but they, uh, they had their forester come in on the climate change webinar on big game. So she's talking about how forestry and fire are related to big game management on the Umatilla reservation. And I think if, if I read you correctly, Steve, it's this kind of a multiple, um, 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 what we used to, multiple use, not in the same way that it used to be in timber, but different possible outcomes from different people with a, with a, with a big hunk of ground. And well, it also, I, yeah, I, I don't know that I call it multiple use exactly. I, I think no, it's looking at integrated landscape. There you go. And fire and other things can do a variety of things. And you want you want some of the totality of the things they do rather than focusing very efficiently on one or two things, making right. a choice of one or two things. 
So yeah. I'm not sure the multiple use model as it was originally developed is correct. No, I was I was searching for a word and that wasn't it. You got me. <laughs> okay. What I think partly interesting about the tribal scene, and it, it's becoming a major political issue in Australia now, uh, lesser degree in, in Canada, but it has destabilized some of the old polarities. You have to choose one side or the other. Now there is a third group which has standing and which has some social and political uh -huh. clout to, uh -huh. um, which is forcing the discussion in a different direction. And I missed it. That's in Alaska, I think that was one of the fundamental things that also entered into it. The Native Claims Act preceded the land authorization, which preceded the fire plan. So they produced, they were able to prevent uh, things from just uh, dichotomizing and going, you're either with, on this side or you're on that. There was a third party that, that so you've got a three body problem in the physics thing for which there is no exact solution. You're constantly in negotiation and recalculating. And it would be nice to see some of that in the lower 48. I like it. Elnora, did that answer your question about, well, somebody could speak to the amount of, uh, of uh, involvement with tribes at the forest service level or nature conservancy or, or will allow resources. I think, uh, I, I, I know just from living here that tribal involvement in everything is way more than it was 30 years ago or 20 years ago. I mean, uh, uh, so, so I, 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 I'm sure that's true with, uh, with forestry and fire as well. Anybody step in on that or Elnora, do you want to be more, more specific with your question? No? Sure. I, I mean, with Deb Holland now as the Secretary of Interior and there's lots of opportunity to change this, I'm just wondering if anything has happened since the Biden administration took over to um, require the Forest Service to consult with the tribes, not only about, not only about issues that um, affect the tribes directly, but also I'm, I'm trying to understand if there is a movement within the Forest Service to say, maybe we can learn something here uh, that's useful and let, let's talk to tribes that we think are um, pretty advanced in their handling of fire and see if there's something we can learn that, that we haven't thought of. What do we think? Well, I, I think there's a lot we can learn historically too. I mean, how did people live for hundreds or in many cases, thousands or tens of thousands of years with fire and uh, more or less successful uh, until a hundred years ago when suddenly <laughs> the developed countries uh, seemed unable to handle it. Um, how did they do all that burning? They didn't do it with the prescribed fire set piece model that we have. Uh, they were much more opportunistic. And I think there's a lot we can learn both today and from the past of how did people actually do this? What does it take to get it done? We have plenty of examples, empirical examples of people succeeding. If they hadn't, they would have been out of the gene pool a long time ago. They managed to make it work. How did they do that that we could learn from? I think CAL FIRE, I, I read something that uh, there's a UROC I don't know, there's some kind of an organization, isn't there some consultation going on there now? Yeah, there's there's a lot in the, the Klamath area, several uh, tribes are involved. Uh, they're getting a lot of publicity. They're doing a lot, they're promoting a lot of stuff. Uh, it's very interesting. We'll see if it, it's hard to move Cal Fire. Uh -huh. I mean, it really is an urban fire model, fire service model. Uh, and uh, they, what they do, they can do very well, but we need to have them do a lot of other things. Whether they can 
whether they can work with the tribe, I don't know. We'll have to say, I hope so. So this is Steve Hawkins. I would, uh, I would offer that um, as far as consultation with the tribes go, they're um, uh, working to, uh, uh, there's a group called the, the Blues Interagency Council, which is the, uh, it's the uh, leadership from different uh, land management agencies, as well as the tribes. Um, and they're meeting on, right now they're working through uh, um, our uh, failed uh, forest plan uh, effort to, to bring that back together um, using the, the leadership of a lot of those uh, 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 local uh, uh, governments, tribal governments, federal, state, and uh, um, working on that. But um, I also know that, uh, uh, for example, the uh, Umatilla National Forest is working on a large project with the Umatilla Indian Reservation um, in the BIA up around the toll gate area um, where they're, you know, that's uh, it's across the landscape, different lands all working together. And so we, um, there is a, a, a quite a bit of uh, effort and uh, in, in talking with folks, um, we're uh, as some of the, the CFLRP proposal, um, we did reach out to those, to the tribes and they um, had um, endorsed uh, different uh projects that we've been doing um, and so there is that that sharing of information and we're working to uh, see what we can do better as far as uh, um, actually uh, having uh, kind of that uh, shared workforce and implementing a lot of the stuff with, that we're going to be working on so I think um, when you start working together in in those regards you start gaining that's part of the beauty of of working with different people as you learn from as you uh, as you work and uh, I expect that to get better. Thank you, Steve. That was good, good stuff. Um, okay, well, we're coming. We've been at this almost two hours. And uh, I know for me, the time has gone very quickly. I've enjoyed it all. And uh, Steve Pine, I want to thank you especially. I thank everybody for tuning in here and thanking all of you who rose to the occasion with your questions and comments. And uh, Steve, I'll let you uh, I'll let you wrap it up with a couple last sentences if you've got them about uh, when you're going to come and visit us or uh, or uh, <laughs> what we might see or hear from you next in the way of books or or articles or uh, where your own investigations are going next. Well, I I I ended my talk with the concept of the pyrocene that we're creating the fire equivalent of an ice age. And I actually have a short book on that topic. It will be published in September. Okay. And that's the title. Okay. So uh, that's where it's taken me. I began my career in fire in uh, 1967 as a smoke chaser on snag fires. And the first fire had blown up tree smoldering on Powell Plateau within the Grand Canyon of all things. And now it's become planetary. So that's where my thoughts have gone. I don't know where else to go with it. But thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to talk. Uh, yeah, I think the other thing I would have added on the Northwest, we didn't talk about Harold Weaver and his contributions, which also managed to integrate forestry into the project and also a tribal lands where he did a lot of his uh, pioneering experiments. So it's, a, it's an interesting place. When I first started this about 10 years ago, or my resurvey of American fire stuff, I thought of the Pacific Northwest as a minor component because since the 1960s, it really hadn't figured largely. Uh, but while I was doing that, it, it's loomed very large now on the national scene. And quite in quite striking ways. So you're you're one of the uh, the hot spots in the national discussion now. I wish you well. But again, thank you for the opportunity to to talk and to meet. And so. thank you very much for for joining us, Steve Pine. And thank all of the rest of you. And uh, stay in touch. Come in and see the exhibit. And uh, we've got a movie next week. And and catch one of Steve's last book, uh, old books, or uh, we'll look forward to the new one, Steve. Okay. Good evening, all.
Nels. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, all. Thank you, Nels. And thanks especially to Nick and Kerry. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Rich. Uh, it was a good discussion. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Rich. Thank you, John. Thanks for your exhibit. We need more of this talk, don't we? Yes, we do. <laughs> and you're making it happen. Okay. Okay. Time to go ride a bike, guys. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>